Hello friends, in this module we will be talking about the other important enzymes and accessory proteins required for DNA replication. These include DNA helicases, single-stranded DNA binding proteins, primase, RNAs H and DNA ligase. The enzyme that harnesses the chemical energy of ATP to separate the two parental strands at the replication fork is called the helicase. At least four different DNA helicases have been identified in E. coli cells. These are rep helicase, DNA helicases 2, DNA helicases 3 and DNA B helicase. The question was finding out which of these is involved in DNA replication. The first three to be investigated the rep helicase and DNA helicases 2 and 3 could be mutated without inhibiting the cellular multiplication. This made it unlikely that any of these three enzymes could participate in something as vital to cell survival as DNA replication. We would anticipate that defects in the helicase that participates in DNA replication would be lethal. One way to generate mutants with defects in essential genes is to make the mutations conditional, particularly temperature sensitive mutations. In temperature sensitive mutants, one can grow the mutant cells at a low temperature at which the mutation is not expressed. This is called the permissive temperature. We can then raise the temperature up so that the mutation is expressed and the mutant phenotype is expressed. This is called the non-permissive temperature. To isolate such mutants, take a bacterial culture and expose it to a muta mutagen and then plate onto a growth medium. Incubate at permissive temperature. After incubation, replica plate the cells from each bacterial colony on two plates. Incubate at permissive and non-permissive temperatures. Arrows indicate temperature sensitive mutants that fail to grow at non-permissive temperature. Pick up the temperature sensitive mutant colonies from the plate and test their ability to replicate their DNA at non-permissive temperature. As early as 1968, Frankois Jacob and his colleagues discovered two classes of temperature sensitive mutants in E. coli DNA replication. Type 1 mutants showed an immediate shutoff of DNA synthesis on raising the temperature from 30 to 42 degrees. They called them quick stop mutants. Whereas type 2 mutants showed only a gradual decrease in the rate of DNA synthesis at elevated temperatures. They were called the slow stop mutants. Why is the isolation of DNA mutants important? The isolation of DNA mutants was important in several ways because it allowed for the identification of the proteins that were defective in the mutant. It allowed for the mapping of these mutations along the E. coli chromosome and it provided an important starting point for the subsequent cloning and sequencing of these genes. Let us now talk about DNA B mutant studies. E. coli cells carrying temperature sensitive mutations in the DNA B gene were taken. At permissive temperature, it would grow. But when raised to a non-permissive temperature, what would happen? DNA synthesis in such mutants stopped as soon as the temperature rose to the non-permissive level. This is what we would expect if DNA B coats the DNA helicase required for replication. Without a functional helicase, the fork cannot move and DNA synthesis must halt immediately. DNA B is the DNA helicase that unwinds the DNA double helix during E. coli DNA replication. The next step was to find out whether DNA B has DNA helicase activity. Jonathan Libowitz 
and Roger Macken proved this in 1986. They use the helicase substrate as can be seen in the figure on your screen, which is a circular M13 Farge single-stranded DNA annealed to a shorter piece of linear DNA, which was labeled at its Y prime end. Let us see how the helicase assay worked. Lebowitz and Macken incubated the labeled substrate with DNA B or other proteins and then carried out electrophoresis of the products. If the protein had helicase activity, it would unwind the double helical DNA and separate the two strands. Then the short labeled DNA would migrate independently of the larger unlabeled DNA and would have a much higher electrophoretic mobility. Thus, DNA B helicase is the helicase that unwinds the DNA at the replication fork. DNA helicases that act at the replication forks are hexameric proteins that assume the shape of a ring. These ring shaped protein complexes encircle one of the two single strands at the replication fork adjacent to the single stranded double stranded junction DNA helicases act processively. The ring shaped DNA helicases found at replication forks exhibit high processivity because they encircle the DNA. Movement of the helicase along single stranded DNA requires the input of chemical energy and this energy is provided by ATP hydrolysis. Let us now discuss the polarity of helicase. Each DNA helicase moves along single stranded DNA in a defined direction. This property is referred to as the polarity of the DNA helicase. DNA helicases can have a polarity of either 5 prime 3 prime or 3 prime 5 prime direction. This direction is always defined according to the strand of DNA bound. In order to check the polarity of the helicase, a simple assay was designed. A single stranded DNA molecule was taken. To the 5 prime end, a 52 base pair labeled oligonucleotide probe was attached and to the 3 prime end, a 43 base pair oligonucleotide probe was attached. This substrate was then subjected to helicase of either of the polarities. The product was then subjected to electrophoresis and the results were interpreted. If the helicase has 3 prime 5 prime polarity, then the oligonucleotide of 52 base pair is released, which can be observed after electrophoresis as can be seen in lane 4. However, if the helicase has 5 prime 3 prime polarity, then the product released would have the 43 base pair oligonucleotide as can be seen in lane 3. DNA helicases separate the two strands of the double helix. When ATP is added to a DNA helicase bound to single stranded DNA, the helicase moves with a defined polarity on the single stranded DNA. In the figure on your screen, the DNA helicase has a 5 prime 3 prime polarity. This polarity means that the DNA helicase would be bound to the lagging strand template at the replication fork and would have a polarity of 5 prime to 3 prime. The substrate of the helicase is a single stranded DNA template. However, helicase being ring shaped needs a helicase loader to be loaded onto DNA. This DNA C protein is the helicase loader. The helicase loader binds to the hexameric helicase and causes a conformational change in the monomeric subunit of the helicase. As a result, the ring structure of the helicase opens up and the helicase is loaded onto the DNA template. Binding of ATP is needed for this activity. ATP hydrolysis takes place now and drives the helicase loader away from the helicase leading to the ring closure. 
after the DNA helicase has passed, the newly generated single-stranded DNA must remain free of base pairing until it can be used as a template for DNA synthesis. As the two strands are complementary to each other, they have a tendency to re-anneal again. The stabilization of the substrated strand is brought about by single-stranded binding proteins which rapidly bind to the separated strands. SSBs bind selectively to single-stranded DNA as soon as it forms and coats it so it cannot re-anneal to reform a double helix. SSBs are coded by the SSB gene. These proteins act cooperatively. Binding of one SSB promotes the binding of another SSB to the immediately adjacent single-stranded DNA. Thus, once the first molecule of SSB binds, the second binds easily and so does the third and fourth and so on. This results in a chain of SSB molecules coating a single-stranded DNA region as can be seen on your screen. Cooperative binding ensures that single-stranded DNA is rapidly coated by SSBs as it emerges from the DNA helix. Once coated with SSBs, the single-stranded DNA is held in an elongated state that facilitates its use as a template for DNA or RNA primer synthesis. Let us now discuss the functions of SSBs. The main function of SSBs is to prevent the single strands from reassociation or re-annealing. The second function is to protect the single-stranded DNA created during DNA replication from degradation from the action of nucleases. The third function is to specifically stimulate the homologous DNA polymerases. We have seen in the previous lectures that all DNA polymerases require a primer with a 3' OH end. They cannot initiate a new DNA strand de novo. How then are new strands of DNA synthesis started? To accomplish this, there is an enzyme called primase. This is a specialized RNA polymerase dedicated to making short RNA primers on a single-stranded DNA template. Primase is coded by the gene DNA G. These primers are subsequently extended by DNA polymerase. Although both the leading and lagging strands requires primase to initiate DNA synthesis, the frequency of primase function on the two strands is dramatically very different. Each leading strand requires only a single RNA primer. In contrast, the discontinuous synthesis of lagging strand means that new primers are needed for each Okazaki fragment synthesis. Because a single replication fork can add hundreds of thousands of nucleotides to a primer, synthesis of lagging strand can require hundreds of Okazaki fragments and their associated RNA primers. Primase activity is dramatically increased when primase associates with another protein at the replication fork called the DNA helicase. Primase and helicase together form the primosome. Primase activity is retarded when it comes in contact with single-stranded binding proteins. Thus, association with helicase activates the primase and association with SSBs deactivates it. To complete DNA replication, the RNA primers used for initiation must be removed and replaced with DNA. Removal of the RNA primers can be thought of as a DNA repair event and this process shares many of the properties of the excision DNA repair system. To replace the RNA primers with DNA, an enzyme called RNase H recognizes and removes most of the RNA primers. This enzyme specifically degrades RNA that is base paired with DNA. The H in its na name 
stands for hybrid in the RNA DNA hybrid. Let us discuss the primer removal process in detail. RNA's H removes all of the RNA primer except the ribonucleotide directly linked to the DNA end. This is because RNA's H can only cleave bonds between two ribonucleotides. The final ribonucleotide is removed by a 5' prime exonuclease that degrades RNA or DNA from their 5' prime ends. Removal of the RNA primer leaves a gap in the double-stranded DNA that is an ideal substrate for DNA polymerase or template primer junction. DNA polymerase fills this gap until every nucleotide is base paired, leaving a DNA molecule that is complete except for a break in the phosphodiester backbone between the 3' prime OH and 5' prime phosphate of the repaired DNA. This nick in the DNA can be repaired by an enzyme called DNA ligase. DNA ligases use high energy cofactors such as ATP to create a phosphodiester bond between an adjacent 5' prime phosphate and 3' prime OH. Only after all the RNA primers are replaced by DNA and the associated nicks are sealed is the DNA synthesis complete. Let us now move ahead and talk about this important enzyme DNA ligase. DNA ligase catalyzes the formation of the phosphodiester bond between the 5' prime phosphate of one strand of DNA or RNA and the 3' prime hydroxyl of another. This enzyme is used to covalently link or ligate fragments of DNA together. This enzyme is considered to be important in replication, recombination and repair. There are two forms of DNA ligase. One requires ATP and the other NAD. During activation, NADH or ATP covalently binds to the enzyme via an amino group lysine in the enzyme to produce the enzyme AMP complex. This is an activated state of the enzyme. In this state, the enzyme binds to the substrate and traverses the DNA until it encounters a gap or a nick. The nick should be between two adjacent nucleotides and the 5' prime end should be phosphorylated. If the gap is more than one nucleotide and if the base pairing is not correct, ligases won't act. The bound enzyme transfers the nucleotide phosphate or AMP to the 5' prime end phosphate of the nucleotide in the nicked region in the process called activation. The enzyme's covalent bonding to the phosphate group at the 5' prime end activates the 3' prime OH group by the nucleophilic attack of the negatively charged OH onto the group of the alpha position phosphate group. It generates a covalent bond between the two to seal the DNA. In this reaction, the enzyme is silent, yet it is bound to the substrate. With the reaction complete, the enzyme dissociates from the substrate. With this, we come to an end of this lecture. In this lecture, we have talked about the important enzymes required for DNA replication apart from DNA polymerases, that is DNA helicases, single-stranded binding proteins, primases, RNAs H and DNA ligase. In the next lecture, we will be talking about topoisomerases. Till then, thank you.